Okay, this is we have Chris Williams, our political editor at WHS 11, with us, and most that wasn't me you, making that noise. <laughs> that wasn't me making that noise. I mean, I'm not going to stereotype, but I think most of us do not equate political editor at a television station and rooster crowing in the background. Chris, you really have a unique story and a unique life. Can you please explain why you're in the midst of what looks like, I don't know, do I see turkeys? I heard turkeys, roosters. Turkeys here. Got some chickens over there. Got some other chickens here. And, and over the way, if you hear some snorting, that <laughs> is a hog. We're, grow we're raising a pig for the first time. We've got some young roosters who are excited because it's first thing in the morning. And uh, they're letting all the girls know that they're wide awake and ready to look for some food. <laughs> So, Chris, when I mean, when did you become a farmer, and where in the world are your overalls? I almost wore mine. I am wearing a denim shirt, and I, I mean, wonder if you're going to give me a hard time for that. Um, and I'm wearing muck boots, which you can't see on camera. So, when we moved back to Louisville about uh, five years ago, my father was ill, and I came back from our station in Phoenix. And in the move, my wife said, "All I want to do is try to have a place where we can have chickens." I had done some urban farming in uh, Phoenix and m my ancestors were farmers and fishermen and lumberjacks but I never grew really grew up around it and didn't know much about it so when we we came in we, we bought an old farmhouse in the Oldham County area on five and a quarter acres so it's not a lot of land but we were able to have chickens and I I designed and built the Taj Mahal chicken coops as I like to describe it thinking we'd get three or four chickens a neighbor said he decided he was going to get out of the chicken game he had 11 chickens including a rooster and he gave us those. And for a year, everything was going great. My wife had had a garden. I really had not gardened much. We had canned some tomatoes. And at Thanksgiving, we were talking about how much fun we were having. And we the, the conversation turned to what if next year for Thanksgiving, nothing on our table was something we didn't do ourselves. But we eat and we laughed and joked about it. And as we talked about it through the winter and talked about this this funny conversation, our friends said, oh, you got your Facebook or Instagram or, or a blog. And so... Now we have a blog called OurHomesteadAdventures.com. Our motto is learning by living because we have absolutely no idea what we're doing. Well, three years into it, we're, we're kind of getting some, some pretty good ideas. But the next year, I'll tell you what, Angie, turkey, mashed potatoes, green beans, onions, sweet potato pie, uh, a persimmon pudding cake because we had persimmon trees on the property. Everything we did ourselves and we ate like kings. And this year, if you listen closely, we have a hog. He has gone from about 12 pounds to 150 pounds in about 10 weeks. And uh, we're trying our hand at uh, raising him, too. Okay, so it is breakfast time. So I, I want a fresh eggs, which is amazing. Yes. There is nothing there is nothing like fresh eggs. And I mean, that's for sure. We have some friends who are urban farmers. And so we're very lucky. But I have to ask you to consider that there's a lot of us who are just having our first cup of coffee to yeah. maybe gingerly walk around this. How do you go from, hey, I'm going to try my hand at urban farming to I'm actually going to raise everything. That includes the turkey and now the, the hog. How do you do that, Chris? I, How do you do that? I will steal a phrase that I hear a lot of politicians use when I cover them, which is, "How do you tag? How how do you eat an elephant, one bite at a time?" <laughs> and that's the thing: you have to just start small. Start with a little garden. A lot of people planting gardens or victory gardens this year. We went big time on our garden this year. We canned about 70 quarts of tomatoes, about 50 cans of uh, quarts of beans. Uh, we have potatoes. And the other night, Angie. I butchered a turkey this week to kind of see where my turkeys were at. Yes, it, I don't take that lightly. Uh, there is a sacrifice that goes into all of this, and we're very appreciative for the gift. But uh, the other night, Angie, we had turkey, mashed potatoes, and green beans for dinner. Everything was from our property. We knew what went into it. It was delicious. Yes, it took a lot of work. But um, you go one, one little step at a time. I will give you a step, Angie. Are you ready for a challenge? I am ready for this a challenge. Simple. Um, and this is something that you can use that is not difficult at all. Last year, my wife said, you know, I think I want to grow some garlic. You Do you cook with garlic? Oh, um, a little too much, says my husband. No such thing. Okay. Very simple. This is the time of the year to take garlic cloves and plant them. You plant them in about an inch or two underground, Ooh. cover them with a little bit of soil. I like to throw some of the dead leaves on top of it just to kind of add a little bit of compaction there and maybe a little decomposition as the winter goes on 
but your garlic will grow through the winter. And you'll be amazed when everything else around you looks dead that you see these little green sprouts coming out of the ground and underneath the ground, don't mess with it until about June, you're gonna have a, a bulb of garlic. We planted garlic in the fall. We, we harvested 35 bulbs of garlic in our first attempt. It wasn't a huge attempt, but it was a, it was a sizable effort and all of our garlic was the size of baseballs. And this summer, my wife and we had, we had, we were, I'm really good at starting the process of the tomatoes and she's really good at the canning. So it's a team effort. Like well, I'll, we'll go out and we'll pick them or I'll pick them with the kids and I'll bring in two five gallon buckets of tomatoes and then I'll throw them through the processors and turn them into pulp and separate things. She spent about five hours one afternoon making um, pasta sauce oh. with tomatoes, garlic, onions and green peppers from our garden and my eyes were rolling into the back of my head when i ate that pasta that night i can only imagine now chris i grew up in rural michigan in a village of holly and i, so, I know it well th that is amazing and we we ate what we grew especially during the cold weather months we didn't have anything i mean yep. i remember my dad hanging the deer from the swing set and I mean, I took a hoof and everything in a paper bag for show and tell. So, yeah. so I get it. I get it yeah. somewhat, but especially what I'll never forget is that we are the ones we tended that massive, massive garden. Cause we knew, I mean, yeah. this is what we were eating. So what is it like for your kids? Cause I remember I helped can that, or I helped freeze that. I helped pick that. What's it like for your kids to know we're a big part of this homestead. Yeah. And, and it's, it's great for them to not just uh, enjoy the fruits of the labor, but be able to take part in understanding the work ethic that goes with it and understanding that there is not everything comes to you just because you you paid somebody something and they handed it to you, that there is a process that goes into it. So I think we're, the, the kids are learning valuable lessons about work and reward and success and failure. We have failed so many times that it's not even funny, but in every failure, you learn something. And sometimes those failures are very, very painful when you're dealing with trying to feed your family, uh, whether it's a plant or an animal or, it, you, but those, but you learn that you have to keep trying. That even when you make a mistake or even when, you know, God forbid, mother nature does not always want to play well with you, you get a you you understand that you have to keep going because if you don't keep going then you've just failed and then you don't the the success is is much more sweet uh after you've gone through some of those trials that's for sure now on a given day how early are you up to tend to the homestead you didn't say i was up with the chickens but i was up with the chickens no, uh, in the you summer, are an honorary member of Great Day Live now for that one. <laughs> that's right. When, when we, uh, the, this time of the school year, um, my wife is a school teacher and she's teaching from home uh, through some of the kids who are not going to school. Our, our school system is, is back in session uh, for the most part full time, but she's teaching kindergartners. So she's kind of getting ready. So I take our youngest boys to school. And then I, when I come home, I get out and I feed all the animals, water the animals. Sometimes she has a chance in the morning to tackle it. Uh, she'll take a look around things in the afternoon if I'm busy, uh, tied up. In the summertime, though, Angie, I'll tell you what. I will be out here sometimes till 10 o'clock at night. And not necessarily because I have things that I have to do, but because I cover politics for a living. Mm -hmm. And many of us have jobs that are um, like that where they're not the least stressful days out there. And, my birds really don't talk back to me. They actually do, when I call them, they'll talk to me, but you know, they don't talk back to me. The plants, they don't care if I've had a bad day. They'll they'll sit there and listen to me talk to them or stare at them. Sometimes I wonder if I've lost my mind in the summertime, Angie, when I'm out here till 10 o'clock when the sun is up or even after the sun has gone down for the day. But it's, it's, um, it's therapeutic. It has to be, especially, I mean, Chris, you and I both, I mean, in our lifetime, it is, I don't, it has never been this contentious politically. And so as our political editor at WHS 11, there has to be some reprieve that you're able to, to step away from it all, even though, I mean, it's not exactly quiet, but it, it's a whole different kind <laughs> it's of- It's a different kind of not quiet. Right? Yeah. yeah, it's a different kind of not quiet, but it's great because you, you get to witness some things. Uh, have you ever had Oprah, Angie? Yes, yes. Okay, so- I was never a fan of it. I'm still not a huge fan. My wife likes it. So I threw a seed in the ground and it grew and this, this okra plant looked like a tree. 
one morning I came out about three, four weeks ago, just before, uh, and maybe it's been a month now, a little longer, when we had a, a good freeze, just before we had a good freeze. And I, and I came out in the morning, uh, and I was trying to get the day started, and I saw this beautiful flower on this okra plant. I had never witnessed an okra blossom before. And it was it was these beautiful, it almost kind of looked like a lily. It, it had a, a yellow and white and purple shades to it. And I thought, man, oh, if I wasn't doing this, would I have witnessed that kind of beauty? The answer is no. So you get the chance to witness some things uh, that you normally wouldn't. Right now on our YouTube channel, uh, we have a video that I shot just with my phone recently while harvesting the last of the sweet potatoes. And it looks like something from outer space. I'll just put it that way. You can look at it. I think the caption is sweet potato or alien. <laughs> and I would have never witnessed that if I, you know, hadn't put the work in. So you see things. It's, it's worth the work. It's oh, worth the extra time. And, you know, uh, some people, they, they, kind of, they, they get involved and then they give up and it gets weedy and they get you know, disappointed in it. And, and it's easy to get frustrated. What did you lose out by walking away from a plant that, you know, just got overgrown? Nothing, mm -hmm. really. But the time that you spent with it probably was enjoyable. And maybe it helped you uh, in 2020 keep your blood pressure down a little bit. Well, okay. Uh, forgive me to my true Southern friends because I am from Michigan, so I'm a Northerner. And here I thought okra was just the blandest of bland things that grew out of it. gumbo the other night with it. I had no, but to, to no. see a beautiful flower. Okay, quick hit round here, Chris. Really quickly, going back for a second, you said earlier on in the interview when you moved back to Louisville. So just give a little history of where you're from and where you've gone. And now here you are. This is this would be a good laugh for you. So I grew up in a tiny desert town in California on the high desert. And I was the youngest of seven kids. And my, my dad had been in the military. I didn't have to move around. Well, I met this girl when I was a freshman in college who was in Michigan, and I chased her to Michigan after a summer in Louisville. When I was a little boy, one of my sisters moved back here after getting married and started a family. And so she'd been in Louisville since I was four or five years old. And so I would come here every summer and spend a lot of time here. My folks decided to leave my hometown about 16 years ago now and moved uh, back to Louisville because they loved it so much. And my wife and I have been all over for my job. Uh, now she was chasing me around the, the country and we tried for years to come to Louisville and it, and it just never worked. But, uh, you know, my wife is a Michigander. Michigan is kind of an adopted home state to me. I have a son named Mackinac and a son named Le Leland. And I, when I moved to northern Michigan, I, uh, my grandfather had been a farmer up there and all these people came out of the woodwork because they were related to me. And I, I didn't know they were related to me. And the, the farming community, the ag community, I really took to, but never thought I'd ever have a chance to try anything even this this small. Uh, and so when we moved back to uh, the area, uh, my dad had fallen ill and I got back here just before he passed away and we helped look after mom uh, now. She doesn't live with us. She still lives at their place. But I knew that I wanted to try to do something a little different. And my wife really wanted to try to have, have chickens. And so we, we tackled it. I, our motto is learning by living. He agrees. We don't know. We don't know what we're doing half the time. We're trying to figure it out, but we have wonderful neighbors. There are wonderful uh, resources online. We've had people reach out to us who, who, you know, they they were inspired by something we tried to do, and that, that's touching because as we've made mistakes and learned things, we can help people out too. I hope that I helped you plant some garlic. In um, a couple of days. Absolutely going to try that. And then, of course, we'll have you back on come spring. And again, Chris, if people want to follow you, I mean, there's a variety of ways that they can do that, including yeah. on Twitter. But go ahead and let us know where can they go and your blog as well. Okay. Our, our blog is ourhomesteadadventures.com. That's also the name of our Facebook page and Instagram. We don't really tweet but we do, uh, with that, but we do Twitter. My Twitter handle is at Chris W News. You can also find my work account, Chris Williams, on Facebook. And, and uh, my Instagram account is at Chris W News as well. Post a little bit of uh, personal stuff on there. But mostly we stick to uh, the Our Homestead Adventure stuff because, you know, I, I know that some people who follow me for politics and everything else and want to make sure that they're informed, maybe they don't really care. Uh, and maybe that's a critic there. But maybe, they don't, maybe they're not huge fans of this or they want to stick to this. So I try, try to stay focused. But what's amazing, uh, and I know we're running out of time, Angel, but what's amazing is uh, late last year I started uh, getting a chance to cover some more ag stories. Mm -hmm. And the farming community has been amazing to me 
uh, here in our area. And uh, it's it's funny because I run into people now and they're like, hey, you're the guy with the farm. And then maybe they'll want to talk about politics. But it, and if I'm at the feed store, they know me as the guy who's coming by to pick up feed. But uh-huh. sometimes they'll talk to me about work. Uh, and the people who get our eggs or have tasted some of the other things that we make here uh, have my wife won a ribbon at the state fair for wild okay, that's wild huge. Jelly. That's uh, huge. Yes, Seriously. Yes. If you go well, to our website, you'll find some recipes that maybe you can take a, a look at as well. Chris, uh, thank you so much for taking the time. I'm going to try the garlic. And by the way, to our viewers out there, I don't talk like this normally. I will use full language. But when they say get you a, I'll say get you a colleague who's like Chris Williams, who invites you and your entire family and the entire crew at WHS 11 to come out and enjoy his homestead. We love you, Chris.